Good evening once again. Many thanks for joining the program. The news in detail with me, Gloria Mutisi, starting us off tonight during a conference that brought together investors from Rwanda and Zimbabwe. President Paul Kagame said that to achieve more development, countries have to come together, pool the resources, knowledge, and reinforce one another. Fiona Mbabazi starts our coverage tonight. The two-day meeting on trade and investment between Rwanda and Zimbabwe was attended by 200 top officials and investors. The President of the Republic, Paul Kagame, told the participants that the two countries share history that has been marked by moments of adversity and tragedy, but also success and resilience, and that the countries are now part of a wider African experience. The history of both our countries has been marked by moments of adversity and tragedy, but also success and resilience. In that, we are part of the wider African experience. Progress does not come easily or without sacrifice. It requires hard work, dedication, and self-reliance. But self-reliance does not mean being alone. No country on our continent can prosper without cooperating within our region. Zimbabwe's Minister of Trade and Industry, Sekai Nzenza, said the agreement signed by the two sides was a key factor in boosting trade. The signing of these MOUs is a major milestone, indicating strong commitment towards cooperation and development of our two countries. In terms of trade, intra-Africa trade accounted for 15% of Africa's total trade in 2019. Your Excellency, this is very low. This low volume of trade, however, gives us an opportunity to expeditiously come up with robust initiatives that propel the growth of our industries. Rwanda Development Board Deputy CEO Zefani Nyonguru say the talks brought together investors from both countries and resulted in tangible results. We also have W2 Industries from Zimbabwe, which also decided to open in Rwanda to expand their operations here, and they involved in development of our school infrastructure, including setting up school laboratories. We also have um, companies that dis discussed supply of coffee, and the company from Rwanda was also able to close a deal where they'd be supplying five tons of uh, roasted coffee and they expect to make the first shipment next week. In addition to trade, President Paul Kagame indicated that Rwanda is ready to accept teachers from Zimbabwe to contribute to education, urging the authorities to expedite the process. Uh, before equipment, I want the people I think Zimbabwe can offer us uh, uh, good teachers. So please uh, work on that uh, with a sense of urgency, since this is what we said. Uh, you can find whatever number you find of quality teachers, I think we we can absorb. Agreements signed between Rwanda and Zimbabwe include those related to technology, tourism, agriculture, and environmental protection. On the second day of the Rwanda Zimbabwe Trade and Investment Conference, President Paul Kagame tasked officials and business leaders on both countries to expedite cooperation in trade, agriculture, and education with a sense of urgency. My colleague, Ethan Tashovia, sat down for an exclusive interview with Dr. Sekai Nzenza, Zimbabwe's Minister of Industry, 
and Kamas for a detailed conversation on the outcomes of this conference and what people should expect from the five memorandums of understanding signed between Rwanda and Zimbabwe. And yesterday we witnessed the signing of five MOUs in the areas of environment, climate change, agriculture, livestock, ICT and also between the private sector. So we're quite excited by the strengthening of the strategic cooperation between the two countries. And there are vast opportunities which I'm happy to talk about between the two countries. So um, one of the, uh, the comments from uh, His Excellency the President, uh, President Paul Kagame, was the, uh, the deals that are sort of urgent. Uh, um, agriculture, textile, mining, but specifically education. What should we expect uh, from um, Zimbabwe's part in uh, the implementation of the deals that have been signed? Uh, His Excellency mentioned that Rwanda was in need of teachers. And um, I'm grateful that uh, His Excellency wishes to cement the relationship that he already has with our President, His Excellency Idim Nangagwa. That friendship is now being translated into cooperation and in education. So the request from the, His Excellency uh, Paul Kagame has been taken on board and when I go back I will transfer the same message to our president and then we will take it from there to see how best we can implement and also meet the needs that have been presented to us by His Excellency President Kagame. The volume of trade between the two countries is still low. I think you mentioned that in your speech yourself. Um, what are some of the long, short, and uh, short and long-term targets uh, for this cooperation to work? The, value, the volume is true, it, it's low, but we are now taking the opportunity to identify what areas we need to focus on in terms of priority. So this conference has enabled us to identify what are the low hanging fruits, what are the areas of cooperation. Today I met with my counterpart, uh, Honorable Beata Abriyamana, and we were able to share the areas of mutual cooperation. From Rwanda's end, they mentioned the need for expertise in agriculture. And Zimbabwe does have that experience that spans many years because we do have the land, the water, the weather which we, yeah. we have. And uh, she also mentioned that um, Rwanda is importing um, soya edible oil from as far as Brazil and also from Asia. Now, Zimbabwe has the potential already we have an agriculture recovery plan where we are going to be growing a lot more soya than we have ever done. And the weather has also been quite favorable. So that's an area that we're going to be looking at in terms of agricultural and agro-processing. And secondly, the other product is sugar. Yes. Zimbabwe grows a lot of sugar and I gather that Rwanda is importing sugar. And during COVID, the need for sugar also increased because the borders closed. Yeah. But here is an opportunity. In Zimbabwe's low world, we are one of the highest producers of sugar in Africa. And we're going to be exploring that as well so that we have cooperation in trade when it comes to sugar. And another Something area? Talks about textile as textiles, well. Textiles, yes, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, now, Zimbabwe's cotton industry in the past, to begin with, was one of the best in the world. But we now have a strategic plan to grow more cotton. And that type of cotton grown in Zimbabwe is also used f not just for oil, but the cotton lint is also quite valuable and we make cotton cake, the cake 
that comes from the cotton seed that's used for stock feed. So we got a whole lot of beneficiation. But let me talk about fabric, which is what Rwanda is really interested in. So we are going to be exploring as part of the bilateral trade, how Zimbabwean grown cotton can be processed and also exported to Rwanda. So in a nutshell, in a, probably as we conclude this, um, what should um, a trader between Rwanda and Zimbabwe expect from the uh, Trade and Investment Conference as, as an action plan? We are very excited about um, the horticultural produce. That's Amount, apart from the soya yeah. and the cotton, I would like to talk about horticulture. Zimbabwe is growing organic horticulture and exporting to Europe. Avocados, oranges, blueberries, peaches, you name them, we've got them. But what's going to happen now is that we are now going to be talking to the private companies and creating that trade corridor between uh, Zimbabwe and Rwanda in the line of horticultural produce. We're also excited by the fact that Rwanda is, Rwanda Air is flying to Harare. And yesterday, uh, in one of the meetings that we had with uh, the private sector federation, we even talked about the possibility of cargo flying from Harare to Rwanda or from Rwanda to Harare. But certainly, I would like to end by saying the low hanging fruit is the whole culture produce. Dr. Seka Nzenza, the Minister of Industry and Commerce of Zimbabwe, many thanks for your time indeed. In other news, Lubumbashi residents in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwandan citizens working in that country say Rwanda's flights to Lubumbashi are going to relieve them of the challenges they were facing during their travels. They also find that this is a great investment opportunity for the people of both countries. Let's now hear from Innocent Mugabo. At around 12.30 p.m., Randers maiden flight touched down at Lubumbashi International Airport in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The reception of Rande and Lubumbashi was a source of joy for the locals. To them, Rwanda's new route to the DRC means a lot to them. The visit reaffirms the strong will of the two heads of state who are determined to strengthen the relationship between the DRC and Rwanda. I find it an activity that we all will benefit from economically. There will be both culture and trade cooperation, which will further unite our people. I'm really excited because we've been at odds for a while. This is a new direction, a vision of brotherhood between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, an opportunity to open to Africa as well. Rwandan citizens living in Lubumbashi say this is a great move for the airline and the people. For us to reach Lubumbashi required us to use a long journey, passing through Nairobi using Kenya or Ethiopian Airways. But all that has been solved with this direct Rand Air flight. Initially, Rand Air will fly the Kigali Lubumbashi route twice a week. Silva Munyaneza, the deputy CEO and chief operations officer, says that this is an opportunity for the people of both countries. This route comes to make it easier for our traders on air travel, not forgetting the visitors. It is an opportunity for us and for our Congolese colleagues to promote trade and other related issues between our two countries. The Rwanda Kigali Lubumbashi route comes after that of Kigali Kinshasa, which will also be followed by Kigali Goma in the coming days, making DRC the only country with three Rwanda routes. Innocent Mogabo, RTV News. Many thanks, Innocent Mogabo. To Health Matters, the, he the Ministry of Health has announced that a cardiology center will soon be set up in Masaka, Chichichiro District. This was during the launch of a five-year national strategy for prevention of non-communicable diseases in Rwanda that also coincided with World Heart Day celebrated every 29th of September. 
Some residents say they've embraced the culture of going for regular checkups, while for others it's still a strange concept. I go for a hypertension checkup at least thrice in a year, and thankfully it is within the normal range. They encourage me to continue eating healthy, avoid lots of salt so I could have a healthy heart. I've only gone for a checkup when I was going to test for HIV. I have never tested for high blood pressure. Perhaps I'll go and test soon because it's likely one can be sick and unaware. Rwanda joined the world in marking World Heart Day. The Ministry of Health Statistics show that 15% of Rwandans have high blood pressure and non-communicable diseases including hypertension account for 44% of all deaths in Rwanda. Rwanda has an ambitious goal of reducing premature deaths due to NCDs by 25%, hence why this Wednesday the Ministry of Health launched a five-year national strategy for prevention of non-communicable diseases in Rwanda. Dr. Daniel Ngamije, the health minister who officially launched the program, says the journey ahead is long but promising because of the projects entailed in the strategy. Long journey, uh, but at least with this strategic plan, costing over 350 billion Rwanda front for five years, we know where we want to go and we know what is required in terms of infrastructure, equipment, human resource workforce, well-trained people, the way we should uh, uh, proceed, especially by coordinating a multi-sectoral action and came with some innovations like uh, the construction of specialized centers for this non-communicable disease. I was saying about very soon the government will construct a heart center in Massacre, uh, but also we are already thinking on some cancer center as well. Uh, so there are some initiatives, some innovation, so that we can handle properly and reduce the number of people we are sending abroad for treating NCDs. Through this program, the Ministry of Health plans to reach 4.3 million Rwandans by 2025. However, there's still a challenge of inadequate data on the prevalence of NCDs in the country. Dr. Ngamije says a budget has been allocated for surveillance and research to bridge this gap. This is a section in, in, in the strategic plan we have a component of disease surveillance and research. So very soon we are going to start a survey uh, detecting people who are affected with some of these non-communicable disease, which we call silent killers. Some, a lot of people, they are not aware that uh, they suffer from these NCDs. Early detection, early care management is one of the solutions if you want to reduce premature mortality due to NCDs. So we work on it uh, by gathering data and then with adequate response. The strategic plan for prevention of non-communicable diseases will cost over 359 billion Rwanda francs over the next five years. According to the World Health Organization, non-communicable diseases kill 41 million people each year, equivalent to 71% of all deaths globally. Cardiovascular diseases account for most NCD deaths, or 17.9 million people annually, followed by cancers, 9.3 million people, respiratory diseases, for 4.1 million and diabetes at 1.5 million people. 77% of all NCD deaths are in low and middle income countries. Staying in the health sector, Rwanda is on the way to achieving the international health regulations of having at least one trained epidemiologist per 200,000 people in every country thanks to the Rwanda Field Epidemiology Training Program. This was noted during the second Field Epidemiology Training Scientific Conference today at the Kigali Convention Center. The conference thus far is highlighting the implementation progress of Rwanda FETP during the last 10 years since the program was implemented. Dr. Daniel Ngamije, Rwanda's health minister, acknowledged the impact this program has had on Rwanda's public health systems over the years, but stressed that they are pushing for more effort to be made in this field for Rwanda to achieve the desired target as per international health regulations. They are there to, uh, to facilitate the process of gathering information 
assess information and turn it or collect data and turn it in information which will inform decision makers in different decisions that uh, the government and the Ministry of Health were taking. This is a, a huge contribution. To go for, just to give you an example, for a localized lockdown at the time of COVID, it's based on facts. Then you avoid to lock without reason any area which doesn't deserve to be locked. So you can imagine if we could just blindly proceed with lockdowns, the economic impact of locking an area where there is no reason to lock, just to give you a sense of what, how the impact is really important, huge. It's phase two of the training. We want to increase the number of uh, candidates per year for this training. Uh, we want to double it, even make it, we time it time three. It's possible so that uh, as I said, we want at least two epidemiologists well-trained in each hospital. The program is implemented as a partnership between the Government of Rwanda, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, the University of Rwanda, the United States Presidency Emergency Plan for HIV Relief, the Centers for Disease Control and other partners. The U.S. Ambassador to Rwanda, Peter H. Vroman, says this partnership has yielded improvement of the public health surveillance systems. The effort that we have put in and the investment that we've put in with the government of Rwanda, with the University of Rwanda, and with AFNAT has been over ten million dollars. And that is an investment in the minds and training of nurses, doctors, researchers here in Rwanda. And they're not just in Kigali, they're all over the country in all the districts of the country. African Field Epidemiology Network Director Dr. Simon Antara remarks on the critical importance for countries to invest in epidemiology field to heighten vigilance for public health emergencies. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we need a minimum of 5,500 epidemiologists. We have just a little above 2,000. I mean, the figure translates to a very small proportion of what we, we ought to be having. And so um, the African Field Epidemiology Network and a, net, uh, a non governmental organization that has been working 2005 to help support develop field epidemiology capacity across Africa has been engaging various partners to see how we can expand field epidemiology capacity training. Um, we, as we speak, we still have countries that do not have any tier of the FETP training. We have countries without any of the programs. So for such country, what that means is that they are lacking an essential element of public health emergency response. So we are engaging every partner. We are engaging existing partners such as the CDC to see how we could expand training across all these countries. We are engaging the Africa CDC. We are engaging ministries of health to see how they can increase investment into this area. The theme for the scientific conference is building resilient, sustainable, innovative public health systems through field epidemiology training. 631 epidemiologists have so far been trained through the field epidemiology training program over the last 10 years. Gloria Mutesi, reporting for RTV News. The Chamber of Deputies has passed a law governing the district, a law that requires the district council to consist of 17 members. As Jane Mutoni reports, the law stipulates that the district council will consist of 17 councillors, including eight elected at the district level. The amendment of the special law governing the city of Kigali includes excluding some of the provisions of the law and remained with the organization, functioning of the district and its administrative organs and special provisions relating to the district. Justice Kangwaje, a former district mayor for 10 years, says that this law will help in speeding up the decision making of the solutions that solve the problems of the people. <laughs> Councillors were many hence coming up with a decision used to take longer because of the differences in knowledge and mindsets. So you would find that the issues that people are facing are not being solved on time. Just like the deputies, they are also happy with this law. I'm pleased with it as well. 
The law stipulates that the district council will consist of 17 councillors, including eight elected at the district level, five representing women, which are 30 percent, and representatives of national youth councils, women, people with disabilities, and private sector representatives. The Minister of Local Government, Katawazi Jean-Marie Vianney, says the changes in the law are aimed at assisting the district governance, especially the councillors, to improve in terms of development and to establish institutions closer to the people. <laughs> The aim is to have councillors with different skills that will solve challenges in the district so that each of the eight councillors of a certain district have skills in certain fields, be it in mining or agriculture. Another thing, this law will enable us to monitor each district in terms of development. The new law stipulates that each district in Rwanda will have 17 councillors, while some districts had 39, 38, and more than 20 councillors, depending on the number of sectors in each district. Jane Mutoni, RTV News.